Welcome to Steadfast Church. Any guests that we have joining us here this morning, we're glad that you're here. And I want to begin our time talking about a garden. Now, I don't know much about gardening. I have a deal with my wife. I make the garden beds that go in our backyard, and she does all of the gardening uh, because I'm not very good with it. However, I do know a few things about gardening, right? There's three things that have to happen for a garden to flourish. God has to do some things, we have to do some things, and we have to take some things away. And so what I mean by that is God has to provide the sun and the rain and the right temperature for this garden uh, to flourish. And then we, we have to add things along the way. We have to do some cultivating and some fertilizing and perhaps some trellis building uh, to make this work. But also, we need to subtract some things along the way. We need to remove some weeds. We need to do some pruning. Right? All three of those things are required for a garden to flourish. If you take any one of those things away, the garden's going to be in trouble. It's not going to flourish the way it was meant to flourish. And what's interesting is that the same is true for us in holiness. God does his work, right? But along the way, we're called to do some cultivation and some pruning in the process. And so we see this play out in our passage here this morning. We're going to see the key to pursuing spirit-driven holiness in a sex-obsessed world. And we're going to see that through pleasing, pruning, and purity. So let's start with pleasing. Starting in verse 1, the text says this, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. And so this passage is exhorting us to please God, and that's an interesting subject, isn't it? I would imagine if I asked you all to think about what what comes to mind when you think of the subject of pleasing, pleasing God, Uh, that there'd be um, different responses. Some folks might think, I'm totally inadequate to be able to please God. I can't do that. I don't have that within me. Others might think, this sounds like legalism. Sounds like an extra thing I have to do to please God to be saved. I don't know if I'm comfortable with this subject. And still others might think, "Uh, doesn't God sound needy in this whole process? If I'm to please him, I'm, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that either. Yet here in this text, Paul is encouraging the Thessalonians to walk in such a way as to please God. In fact, the subject of pleasing God appears all throughout the Bible. Just to to give you a sampling of this, Psalm 104 says, a meditation to the Lord is pleasing to God. Romans 12 says, presenting your body as a living sacrifice pleases God. Romans 14, looking out for your weaker brother pleases God. 1 Timothy 2, praying for your governing authorities pleases God. 1 Timothy 5, supporting family members in need pleases God. And the list goes on and on. So what does it mean to please God? Are we even capable of this? Is this legalism? What's this business all about? Well, this makes me think of of me as a father with my kids. Right? There's no amount of disobedience that would cause me to love my kids any less. And if you're a parent, you know that sort of unconditional love. And even if, as a child, I hope you, you've sensed that from your family as well. No amount of messiness, no amount of bad grades, no amount of lying, no amount of disrespect is going to cause me to love them any less. And yet when I see them obeying, when I see them walking in the way that I've raised them, it brings me joy. It pleases me. And this is the same for God. He's our Father. We are loved unconditionally. We are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And in Christ, there's nothing we can do to cause Him to love us more or any less than He does right now. Yet, when He sees us walking in obedience, it pleases Him. And this is good news, because God is not a stoic lifeless, robotic figure, right? He's a person. God's a person. And he's not apathetic to our, or our obedience. He's committed his joy to it. That's good news. And for me, that's simultaneously humbling and encouraging. So here Paul is saying, walk in a way as to please God. That should be our desire too, to see the joy of 
of our Heavenly Father as we walk in obedience. And then Paul transitions into uncovering one of the greatest mysteries of life. Paul addresses a subject that has confused people from the beginning of time, and that is God's will. So starting in chapter 4, verse 2, he says this, For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. You want to know what the will of God is for your life? Your sanctification. Paul just told us. Now that may seem like a little bit of a letdown, right? He didn't tell us where to live, where to work, who to marry. Yet the language is still pretty strong. God's will for your life is sanctification. Sanctification is the process of becoming more and more like Jesus. I like this definition too. This is sanctification is the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. Now, if we trust Christ for our salvation, we've been regenerated. That means the Holy Spirit has come into our life and he's making us a new creation, a new creation molding us into Christ likeness. And so here in the first two verses, Paul is saying, please God by obeying him, and then please God by becoming more and more like Christ. This is what you were made to do, Thessalonians. This is what you were made to do, Christians. And then here, Paul <clears throat> makes a transition in the text. He's still on the subject of pleasing God, but he's going to get really specific and pointed and discuss how to please God by pruning, how to subtract some things in our life. And starting in verse 3, he says this, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, this is the word of the Lord for us, right? And things got real all of a sudden in this text, didn't they? <laughs> all this generic pleasing God language just morphed into a very personal, specific, pointed challenge. And this may seem like an abrupt change, but it's not. Paul has said to please God, to, to obey all the instructions we give you. And now he turns his attention to the things they are not obeying. And he starts with their sexual practice. Now, why does he start here? Well, clearly this was an issue for the Thessalonians, right? It's an issue they struggled with. But I can't also help but think that Paul started here because what we do with our body is one of the hardest things to give over to God. The normative sexual ethic for those in Thessalonica was so at odds with the Christian sexual ethic that Paul wanted to make sure that they weren't co-opting the cultural sexual ethic into their faith. Now, just for context, know this. If you were a man in Greco-Roman culture, you would most likely have a wife with kids, but you'd also have a concubine. You'd also have some slaves who you were permitted to have sex with along the way. And the list goes on and on and on and gets darker and darker and darker. And in many ways, these, these few things I just mentioned were just the tip of the iceberg. And so Paul starts by saying, abstain from sexual immorality. And the word that he uses here in the Greek makes it clear that any activity outside of a monogamous heterosexual marriage is immoral. Now that teaching would have been countercultural to the Thessalonians, and of course, it's countercultural to us as well, right? We've been catechized to think that we can do whatever we want with our body. We say, this is my body. I can do whatever I want to do. No one gets to tell me that. Yet the gospel says something different. The gospel says, you are not your own. You are purchased at a price. Our body is not ours. It's God. Right? And if God is real, and Jesus truly is the Son of God, then he's the Lord of our life. We don't get to hoard off certain sections of our life and keep them from Jesus. We need to give them all to him because he is the Lord of our life. He's the Lord over every facet of our life. There's no silos with God. 
None. And if this sounds narrow, it's because it is. <laughs> this is the narrow way. This is the self-denying, take-up-your-cross way of living. The Christian story, the fall, tells us that we're all sinners. And sin tainted everything that was good in God's design. So that means for us, it's not a question of if our sexuality is broken, it's a question of how it's broken. At some point in our flesh, all of us will find the Christian sexual ethic offensive. Yet Paul is saying here, there's life and there's flourishing when you obey God. And there's pain and there's emptiness when you don't. Now Paul further clarifies the sexual ethic starting in verse 4. He says this, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Paul is is saying, in abstaining from immorality, show self-control. Operate out of love, not lust. Operating out of love seeks the best for others. Operating out of lust ends up being selfish and destructive. And then lastly, Paul says in verse 6, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. And this is a reminder for us that sexual sin has consequences beyond our own soul. It impacts those who are around us. And not just in situations of abuse or adultery. Right? Satan likes to tell us, he lies to us, he likes to tell us that our personal sin doesn't impact very much. It doesn't impact us, it doesn't impact people around us. Yet, There's always a communal aspect to our sin. Our personal sin life will inevitably impact those closest to us, no matter how much we try to hide it or contain it. Remember, with sexual sin, it's not just about your holiness, but it's about the community's holiness as well. So then Paul closes his exhortation on ethics with a call to purity. Starting in verse 7, he says, For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So when I ask one of my children to clean the table, and they willfully choose not to, it's frustrating, right? As a parent, if you're a parent, you know that. But in that moment, they're essentially saying, hey, I know you have the authority to ask me to do whatever you want. I know you're looking out for my my well-being. I know you're trying to raise me uh, into adulthood, but I'm not going to do what you're asking me to do. (laughs) That's That's what they're essentially saying when they don't obey you. And it's the same for us with God. These sexual ethics are not in place because of some culture war or some tradition or because Uh, God's holding back on us, right? Uh, These ethics are in place because God has meant them for our good. To not obey is to disrespect God. And so this whole passage here, it's, it's not about sex. The passage is about holiness. The work of the Holy Spirit sweeps into every area of our life. And in that way, the Holy Spirit is an equal opportunity offender. There's no area of our life he leaves untouched. Whether we like it or not, our sexual ethics act as a megaphone for what we believe. They will either be our greatest witness or our greatest deterrent. John Stott was a famous Anglican pastor and theologian. He once said, Christians have become a people known for preaching the gospel, but not living it. And that hurts because it's true. We talk a lot about the saving message of Jesus, but then we don't live out the implications of that call on our life. And yet I admire John Stott for saying this. This was a man who lived a life of celibacy, who most likely found it very hard to follow the Christian sexual sexual ethic, yet by all accounts did for his own good and for his flourishing. He was a man who preached the gospel but also lived it, and that's very humbling. One of the ways the early church stood out from the surrounding culture was their distinctive sexual behavior, and it's one of the ways they grew so much. Their distinctive sexual ethic made them 
uh, strange and weird, <laughs> but in all the best ways, right? And wouldn't that be amazing of us? If people thought us strange and weird, they probably do, but if they thought of us as strange and weird in all of the best ways, we'd have a great impact with our neighbors, our coworkers, and our friends if we preached the gospel and then lived it. So I began talking about a garden at the beginning. A garden requires many things to thrive, including some weeding and some pruning. And the weeding and pruning is done not to hurt the garden, right? But to help it flourish. Now, when we hear words like abstain and control, which are, these are words that, that appear in this passage, we're trained to think oppression. We think uh, these, are, these are not words of life. These are words of restriction. These are words trying to hold us down. God is a cosmic killjoy, we might think. Yet, he's quite the opposite. He doesn't mean to restrict us. He means to free us. For our joy and for his joy, he's calling us to flourish, to become what we were made to be. Make no mistake, God's design for holiness is hard. It's incredibly hard. But it's worth it. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we, as we read this text, uh, we just confess that we, we fall short, that we're all broken uh, sexually. We all <clears throat> use our body in ways that is not to your design. And Lord, we repent of that. And we invite you, through the work of your Spirit, to work in our lives. We want to give every area of our life over to you for refinement, for conforming into the image of of Christ. And Lord, we acknowledge that. We do that for your joy. We do that for our joy. There is a, a beauty in your design. And when we lean into that design, it is freeing and it's life-giving. And would you remind us of that, Lord? Continue to refine us. Continue to call us uh, to purity, Lord. And make us a people who really do want to please you. Make us a people who not only preach the gospel, but live it. We pray these things in your name. Amen.